Hello and a very warm welcome to another session of the Change Exchange. My guest for this session, Marianne Tam, is uh, she says she doesn't know if it's associate or assistant, assistant editor know. of the yeah, Daily Maverick yeah. because the Daily yeah. Maverick is not a structured place and we will talk about that. <laughs> Um, she's a journalist, has written several books about other people, and lately what she calls a memoir of sorts, called, uh, which one's first? Hitler, Favort, Mandela and Me, which is a, quite a provocative yeah, isn't title. It? Isn't it just... Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. being Thank here. Thank you for asking me. The first big change in your life happened when you were two, and you had obviously no choice in the matter, no. when your parents brought you here from England, yes. and that has made all the difference. Well, I'm so grateful for it. I mean, it is, I, I keep on thinking that they could have taken me to Australia. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, everything I am and everything I've become and everything I've learned has been uh, at a cost to other South Africans. Um, but my internal architecture is completely constructed here. I can't, mm -hmm. it doesn't, no other place in the world resonates with me so much as here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, ex I'm extremely grateful for it. Although at times in the, in the 1960s and 70s, I was quite angry about it and wanted to know why. Mm -hmm. Why do you come to a place where there's such pain and where people are perpetuating something? Um, so why did they make time. that choice? Do you well, think? I think my father it, it blames it on his asthma, which I think is, you know, go to a hot climate. Mm. Apparently the doctors used to tell you back then. Mm. But I also think he got a job at Arms Corps in South Africa, in, in, in Littleton, in Pretoria. So my father was a mechanical engineer. And in the book, of course, I, I discovered during my sort of 50 year visits to my father and, and our incredible political arguments, I realized why he came to South Africa. So I've got really bad karma on the German side. It's so bad that there's no, even, no point even doing any penitence. It's like really awful. But um, so he came to South Africa to work for Littleton, um, for arms school, actually. Mm. And, and that's how we got here. And my mother was a housewife. She was uh, barely literate, semi-literate. She was a cleaner for English people in, in, in England. She went of after Portuguese the war. extraction. Of Portuguese extraction, of a small mm. village in, in uh, a mining village. Uh, so, yeah. Economic migrant and a war criminal, <laughs> and out I popped in England, and here we are. <laughs> it's a bit of a mixture, to isn't start it? With. Isn't it? Um, and possibly the best preparation for journalism. Why well, did I you choose know. that? Well, I think I, what made me choose it was being very conscious as a child of a lot happening around me, uh, being told not number one not to associate with the Afrikaans children in my neighbourhood. They were working class Afrikaans children, very wild, sort of schooner with this really you know no shoes and you know hair punskopis and you know not liking us as immigrants at all because we were a little group of immigrants living there. So. That was the, the one part of, of, of it, and I've completely forgotten what your question was <laughs> as I, as I why, go back. Why journalism? Oh, why journalism? Um, and I could also see sort of we would have uh, Ndebele women also walking past our houses on their way home in Pretoria, you know, with, with those beautiful traditional dresses playing an original iPod, which was that stick with a piece of twine on it. <laughs> you know, make music while you go. I think that Steve Jobs should credit Ndebele people for that. Um, and I would wa watch Tani Brechi, Marie, where Tani start chasing black people off the lawn like dogs, you know. So you begin to notice something's not okay here. You know, groups of people arrive to work on the road and the white guy's in his safari suit and the black men are all working and he's just watching. And so as a child, you begin to realize something's not okay in this place and you begin to ask the adults around you, what's going on here? Why, why is there this feeling of, of perpetual, don't go to the river, someone's going to eat your heart. You know, there's going to be mooty killings. And so this terrible fear of a world outside of the neighborhood made me question, well, what is it? What is this thing they're talking about? Why, why is it happening? And then also experiencing the way those Afrikaans kids dealt with my mother and what they thought she was and what they thought my father was and what they thought I was and thinking, oh, no, nobody knows what's going on here. You know, let's, let's. So you wanted to understand and communicate. And communicate and stop it. I wanted to stop in a way it's horrible to watch a human being being chased away somewhere like a dog as a child. Mm. It's, mm. it's di diminishing. Mm. And, and, and you, want to, you want to go and say to the person, I'm sorry, uh, and, you know. And did you see journalism as an instrument? Well, I saw it only as an instrument when I read Peter Durkheis in the, in the Sunday Express. 
um, I had no idea that there was a way of doing it because um, you know you, you're isolated as a white community, immigrant community, with Dutch people, German people, Portuguese, Greek, anyone from Europe sort of mm. ended up in that neighborhood in Pretoria, Parktown mm. in Pretoria, with, with sort of working class Afrikaans kids around us. So, so wherever you turned, there wasn't an answer. And then my dad would get newspapers uh, and I would wait for them on a Sunday and we would fight about which sections to get my brother and I and my father. But I would then, I then discovered Evita Basayda note in the Sunday Express. And it was like, oh my God, there is... This yes. can make a difference. No, there's a man who sees what I'm seeing or a person, a character who gets it, who... who mm. I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that I was able to communicate with or, or somehow f find attraction, a, a, mm -hmm. a traction, mm -hmm. uh, with a philosophy or way of seeing that someone else did through a newspaper. And I thought, well, this is the vehicle, this may be. But I didn't, I didn't think about it as a job, of, as a profession for a very long time. I mean, it was, I wanted to be an ice cream seller. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, you've got the bicycle and then you just eat it all and try and sell it. So those were my ambitions <laughs> as a child. I don't think my parents also, because they were not sort of wasp uh, families who kind of have, you know, trust funds where children go for education. I, I think they were just dealing with the moment. So there was yeah. no discussion about what are you going to be. My father said, you know, a grave digger is a good job to have because people always need graves and you always start at the top as a grave digger, you know, because it was a joke. But he wanted me to be a hairdresser because people always need their haircuts. He's probably right. I might have, should have, I would have been a good hairdresser. It would have paid better, probably. Uh, probably well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, then yeah. when you started, it was the 80s, yeah. very, very rough times, mm. and you worked as a crime reporter yeah. in the beginning. Yes. How did that affect you? Well, it was, I was, young I was woman, 20, Cape Town, 21, 22, beat. yeah, that was horrible. I, I realized in, in, in retrospect, being exposed uh, on one level at that young age uh, without any containment to, so, so because I was so young, I wasn't writing opinion pieces or, or looking at the bigger picture. So you'd go into somewhere where a murder had happened and this country is extremely violent, was then and is now. And often the newspaper only covered white murders, mm. you know, so it would be family murders and, you know, all of the, all of the bubbling under, uh, pain and, and violence that was in the society. Um, um, I think I got used to it. I think I used the notebook as a way of uh, distancing uh, yourself. Distancing my, yeah, yeah, sort of. But at the same time, not looking away. I've, I've I've learned as a journalist that you owe it to the people who have suffered to look into their suffering, to 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 bear it with them. Because who else does? It's so easy to just go. Oh, I don't want to know. That's too hectic, you know. So there was something about the. Um, Respect. Well, seeing it and realizing it, it's it's horrible. But people need to be contained in in, in a violent and awful situation, um, and that we are, as human beings, we are capable of horrendous horrendous violence towards mm. each other. But at the same time, you're capable of extraordinary kindness and and magic. You know, so I had to uh, survive by holding the two um, in in my mind that that this is not all because as a crime reporter and the cops see it too, you see people at their worst. Mm -hmm. really at their worst. I mean, somebody doesn't just get stabbed once, you know, and you get to the crime scene in those days um, with the cops and so you, you often see the victim or you see the children who've been killed in the bus accident or you, you smell the flesh of the burning person in the car, which was one of my first stories. Um, but, you know, that's life. You know, that is life and we have to be witness to it. So for some reason, I think maybe there are parts of my brain that are irreparably damaged through it. But it is a way of, I think, locating yourself very much in the real world. I mean, you, I almost want to say you tried to get away. You experimented in 1988. Yeah, you yeah. went away, went overseas. Yeah. Where did you go? Well, I went. I, I, I had a partner then who was Canadian and who was living in South Africa at the time, a writer. And because we, I mean, we didn't have rights as gay and lesbian people, and she was unable to remain here and needed to leave the country. And I'd never left and never planned to leave. But it was also 1988 was sort of the peak of the civil war in South Africa. There was mm -hmm. two states of emergencies: one in 1985. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mandela, we had no idea Mandela was going to be released in two two years. It looked two, years. It, it, as it, if it, nothing it, would it ever change. It was never going to end. Yeah. In, in fact, the Berlin Wall was still up. Yeah. And she said, come out, leave, get out, get, come with me. Let's go to England. Let's go. You were born in England. Get your British passport. Get out. Um, so I saved for my air ticket and I went uh, because I wanted to get out. But the minute I arrived uh, in Europe, I also wanted to know what freedom felt like. I wanted to know, are there places in the world where people don't every day look at how a government oppresses people or where you mm. worry about a bomb going off somewhere or, or where you will get arrested or killed. Mm. I mean, it was just, you know, if you look at the numbers 
and you look at that violence, um, and so life seemingly goes on, but actually... Yeah, and you were so close to it constantly. Very close to it, very close to it, with no, with no place to dump it except on the pages, but black South Africans had no place to dump it, they lived mm. with it, so, you know. Mm. Um, but you got yeah. to England? I got to England and worked at the London Times, just also once again fluke and fraud, because I've always managed to slip in somewhere, somewhere. Um, we had started working on the electronic ATEX system in South Africa before the English did, because of their very strong unions. And uh, the British newspapers at the time, Wapping, didn't really now understand ATEX, and we'd been playing, I think, ping pong and tennis on the ATEX systems in our newsrooms for many years. And so I, I worked as a sub at the London Times, which was an extremely unpleasant experience, apart from myself and an Australian. Um, it was culturally a huge shock for me to be in England. I mean, I did not understand the English. So we'd sit in this horseshoe subbing, which is, you know, an awful job. I can't, sub, I'm not a good sub. And, and uh, with all of these English people, and someone would burst into tears and everyone would just ignore it. It would be like, oh my God, there's a situation, someone's crying. <laughs> And then myself and the Australian would go like, hey, are you okay? Would you, can I get you some tea? Are you, you know, the Australian would be flip-flops and I would also, and so we were the only two who were not dressed in sort of those days, I think it was blue shirts with white kind collars. Kind uniform, yeah. Yeah, with water that everybody drank with briefcases. We just like, hey, we had to sub, you know. Um, and so it was an eye-opener for me to realize mm. culturally that the, I don't have an Anglo-Saxon orientation. So you started defining yourself almost by seeing what you're not. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And realized, mm. look, I mean, it's a complete accident that I was fluke, fluke of geography that I was born in England. It's just, you mm. know, mm. I'm, I'm not English. So um, what brought you back to South Africa? That I, I, I went to Canada for a while as well and began to read books I couldn't read in South Africa that had been banned in South Africa. So I sat in the Vancouver Library and read Steve Biko and mm. uh, biographies of people who I wasn't able to look at, you know, read about before, uh, books on Athol Fugard. And mm. I thought, but this is, this is, this is my internal landscape. This is my home and I'm going home. I need to go home. I need to be there. I don't know these people. I can't write for the Canadians. Uh, I couldn't, you know, mm. I, I don't know what to say to the English. Mm. Um, uh, uh, basically, it was like I felt lonely. I felt I needed to come home, uh, even though mm. it was a horrible place. And make a difference. There's a lovely uh, uh, French saying that if the disgusted leave, only the disgusting remain. <laughs> Um, so I still I still think about that a lot. Yeah. And uh, how did Daily Maverick happen? Well, you know, Daily Maverick happens. How Daily Maverick happens? I, I had decided in, in in the early 1990s that I really am not constructed for corporate media. I I, I, I can't I, I can't clock in with a security card every day. I put my bag through. It's not how it works for me. Um, and decided to try, I could see the internet was arriving and I could almost try and see around the corner in terms of where that would take us in the media, but not many of my colleagues that are my age were quite there yet. Uh, I think when you're trapped inside the valley, you can't see mm. the mountains. So I left, um, um, as a, partly because I had been, been able to just resign and go in 1988. And everybody would say, but like, have you got a job? And how are you going to do it? And I was ridiculous. I was, I think I was... 33 when I left, and I was, it wasn't young. And I just thought, well, you know, I'll do something, I'll waitress, I'll, you know, that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and I had that again when I left, because I just knew there's no way I could stay in formal uh, employment. Uh, I, I, my hours are different, I, I, I love what I do, I can't do 95, I can't. So, uh, I met, you know, many, Daily Maverick only came into my life towards the end of the last five years. And I mm. met Branko through, I was writing satirical pieces for um, ZA News, it was South Africa's mm. version of Spitting Image. Mm. And that was an interesting thing to try and do and see. And, mm. and so you, I did scripts for these puppets and met Branko, who's my age, and grew up in Yugoslavia. So I have somebody, you know, who's interesting in that the country he grew up in doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And, he'd, and he'd lived through a war. Um, the country I didn't, I grew up in doesn't exist anymore and I'm happy it doesn't exist anymore. For him, not so much. Huh? Uh, so, so that was our connection, I think. We're both in our 50s and um, I think Mavericks. Anyway, so uh, that's how I ended up there. Uh, what yeah. can I say? Yeah. You know, I had been out of that kind of mainstream journalism for a very long time. I didn't go to Rhodes, so I wasn't connected to that Rhodes group of, of students who are yeah. the Anton Harbors and the uh, Sean Johnsons and the, you know, all, all of these, you know, fabulous journalists. You were a maverick, there. always. Yeah. But you, you started writing books and longer pieces, um, and the first one, I think, was about Alison Boerta. Yes, yes. Uh, that we did a, a carte blanche story on mm. her of course, which all also, I mean, it will stay with me forever. Mm. 
Uh, how did you connect with her and how did the okay. decision come about to write that? Uh, you know, Jane Faley uh, was the editor, uh, you know, the editor of Associated Magazines and I found myself completely by accident there because, I mean, I don't read women's magazines, never had. But Jane was really visionary at the time and realised in the 1990s that the country was changing. And she wanted to use her products and you know, introduce readers to Balek and Bet who'd been yeah. in exile. So she wanted it to be a sort of Vanity Fair cross mm. women's magazine and employed myself and uh, Pippa Green who you know, seasoned you know journalists who only wore one outfit and shoes was you know, rolled her own tampons and you know cut her own hair. <laughs> no, nothing like you know. But uh, as through Jane, I, I sort of got to do the story because you know Alison had survived the attack and then maybe you know, we must just uh, for viewers who may not know, Alison Boerta was attacked. When was it? 19... I think 1997, 96. Yeah, dreadful attack in outside Port Elizabeth, in the bushes um, outside, her throat was cut, she had... She was disemboweled. I mean, yeah, um, two dozen or more hmm. knife wounds in her tummy. Uh, she was raped, she was left for dead. And she pulled herself, holding herself, literally, physically, and walked to the road and was saved by a number of people who interacted with her afterwards and lived to tell the tale. Amazing woman. Mm. You know, so I met, I met with Alison and I thought what was interesting, partly from a, just a writer's perspective, that I, I saw in front of me a story that had a good ending already. Mm. And the, the challenge was I'd never done a marathon piece like that before. Yeah. I mean, when, mm. when today everyone is writing and it's fantastic and there's so many young people who are able to do the marathon work of a, of a book. And there wasn't that much at that time. And I had left and I think Penguin had approached and said, look, we want to do this book on Alison. And, 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 had um, you done the story for Femina? I had done uh, for, for, for Femina at the time and we, and we had nominated Alison as Woman of the Year. Oh. So she sort of, that, that is, was Jane's idea. And that's how I connected to Alison. And I think we, we understood each other, you know. Mm. Or, and as a journalist, you know what, it's, mm. what happens. And, and what I also found fascinating about the story was the, to try and determine the architecture of the book because there were so many voices in the story. Mm. And so I had to plot, how would I tell the story so that the reader can continue to read without being overwhelmed by the horror of it? Yes. Um, and so it was an exercise in writing. And so what I did was I realized I'll stop. I think I'm a natural storyteller. So I'll stop where you just can't bear it and I'll bring in another voice. So it gives you relief. Mm. And I realized, well, that was going to be the structure. So it was, a, you know, and I, once I'd had that, I, I knew where I was going to take the book. Um, so from a purely technical point of view, it was, uh, it was my kind of my university of learning what, how do you tell a, long, long, a longer narrative, mm -hmm. uh, how do you lose yourself and, 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 and do honour to the person whose book you're writing, so there's no room for you there. Um, and it was also very nice to be able to go, not, you know, it was challenging to go back to, to Port Elizabeth, uh, work out where the moon was, measure the light, uh, put myself and put the readers in that space with Alison, you know, I could hear music coming from a shop around the corner. I asked her, could you hear it that night? Because mm -hmm. one's senses are also heightened in that moment. Mm -hmm. We all know. So that was an interesting thing to challenge. A challenge was to, to become, to go back into that space, be Alison in that moment and, and capture the terror and the fear and, and take the readers straight into that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was surprised at how kind of <laughs> I needed to see how many flat windows were up there and where the car was from her door um, and various other things, which, which then, you know, built up a muscle, a writing muscle, which I used later on when I needed to. So that was my first project. I only had two dogs to worry about at that point. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And um, at times had to go and sell CDs in Long Street to survive. But no, yeah, you know. I was just going to ask, did it become financially viable? No, I mean, could you no. keep yourself? No. No. Uh, no. I mean, everybody seems to think because the book has sold 95,000 copies that I must be sitting in the pound seats. Well, that's not the case. Well, I got paid 10,000 Rand for it. <laughs> you know, so, and then I, get, I got like, I, get, I, I used to get a royalty of Alison's royalty. It's her story, mm. you okay. know, uh, it's her story. So, And after that, when you, you did a number of others? I'm trying to remember now. I mean, it's like kind of, they, they almost, they are their own things once I've done them, because it's not really me in there. You know, mm. it's, 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 it's mm. the job, it's the thing I've been taught to do. Mm. So it's hard for me to hold on to them. But could you, you know, did you um, negotiate better, a better deal no, the next time I'm, around? I'm, no, no, I'm Portuguese. I, I'll always sell it to you for <laughs> less than you should be getting it for. You know, no, I'm joking. But no, I, I'm, I, I have a, 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 I've, I've changed a lot. I've had to learn to change. 
I dislike money immensely. Mm. I find it a, a very irritating thing to deal with. But when you're freelance, you have to mm. respect yourself. And so I know what I want and to your charge. Work. And my work. And I do respect both. So if you mm. can't afford what I need, you need to pay me, then I don't do it. It's mm. very simple. It's like the plumber comes and says, this is what it costs. And you go, okay. You can't say, listen, oh man, come on, you know. Yeah. Do it for two rand. You know, so, mm. so I've learned that I'm, and I'm not scared of not being a journalist. Um, I'm not scared of, of, you know, I have lots of ideas and I have lots of interesting things I want to do. So almost a, a compulsion to continue. You will find a way. Yes. Mm. Even mm. if I have to open a shop and sell you one ply toilet paper in a three ply neighborhood, <laughs> I'm going to do it. You know, so, so. You've also written for the stage and actually performed. I don't know if what? I've written for the, I suppose you could say it's written writing for the stage. You know, I was very interested at one point you, uh, by, the, by the lack of female comedians in South Africa. And this is 2010, and I'd met Anne Hirsch and Jimmy yeah. Isaacs and Anthea Thompson, who's a great character actress. And I was just, I was hankering for female energy on stage, comedians. I mean, I, now they're wonderful comedians, but back then it was mostly men. So I went to go and write about the Cape Comedy Collective, which uh, Mark Lottring started off, Riyad Musa, Kachiso Ledija, Tracy Class. I mean, it was this little strange thing we would perform on Sunday nights, get paid a hundred rand. I thought, yeah, what the You know, not a hundred rand. No, this is worse than journalism. I can't be doing it. But uh, um, so I, I did it a bit because it'd been something I wanted to do. My what was it is, like the first time standing on stage? Well, the difficulty is I don't like scripts. I want to do sort of like comedy jazz. Um, which so, But then what the, the trick to that, and I realize you do need a script. Because you, you need a basic structure and then you can play with it. Yes, that. because of course, you, you know, and, and, and if you perform every single night you start forgetting like was is this tonight or last night and did I say this already or didn't I you know it's it, it is I, I admire actors yeah. who can hold in mind entire character parts yeah. Um, so it started there. I mean, and then but I, I still want to know what was it like? When it was the it first was time terrifying you and exhilarating. Um, I mean, it's almost you know. I think it's what's interesting about it is it's a very male medium because you need to have a strong ego on stage. You're like yes. a gutted fish when you're there, you know. So and also what's interesting is as a woman when you arrive, you are viewed or were viewed differently. You know, so people. So that's your advantage as a female comedian because everyone's expecting one thing, and then you, I mean, if you see Ali Wong, I don't know if you know Ali Wong. She's pregnant on stage and speaks about unspeakable things on stage now but so that was the advantage but I yeah. missed I missed how women viewed the world and I didn't want to do comedy about men mm. I wanted to do comedy about like spaceships and and other things mm. you know and very few women were doing that they were always trying to do the sort of stand-up genre which is very specific that men were doing and I, th and I at the time believed you know it was French and Saunders and Ruby Wax and those kind of women uh, um, uh, even Whoopi Goldberg you know that, that women bring something else to, co mm. to, to, to comedy and I was thirsty and but I realized that you can't get other people to do something you've got to do it yourself and then they come so that was there was a schlep of like then inserting myself on the program so it was four of us decided in 2010, in the middle of the Rugby World Cup, of course we didn't realize it was on, you know, there's some people who, you know, we asked the backs if we could use their biggest venue and they said, yeah, sure, because they knew like nobody no would be around. <laughs> so it was the flip side of the backs and was on Broadway on Long Street, but everyone who didn't like football came. Yeah. That was a nice thing. And a lot of them were women. So you got four different frequencies of humor from me. I mean, um, you know, in essentially my book and all my comedy that I, that I do or did do, I don't call myself a stand-up comedian, everybody else does, but uh, is my revenge on the 20th century. It's my revenge on the world. It's like, mm. come on guys, you know. Mm. So I show people ads I found uh, in Fair Lady when I was doing a collection of their work. I'm ridiculous ads. And young people, so I talk politics mm. through space travel, through mm. the Russians who went first, uh, through all these other things that matter. And I think one of the reviewers uh, which was so telling, wrote, wow, wow, none of these women man bash. So I was thinking, but like, why would we make a comedy about men? I mean, it's, oh. yeah. do you yeah, always want to be the main character? Well, uh, yeah, you, see, you realize that that was the problem, is that it always, oh, yeah. four feminist comedians, they're going to, you know, it's like, no, it's about, yeah. about life, unblocking a toilet. Yeah, um, yeah. and then, uh, how did you how did you stop? How did you walk well, away? I mean, was just, or was it always going to be? No, a... I mean, it was terrifying. It was wonderful. We, uh, you know, I've got this Portuguese calculator in my head and said to the foreman, "Yar, we're going to kill it, man. We're going to fall this theatre." So, you know, you know, you, 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 all the comedians. If you speak to them, it's it's years of work. Um, yeah. 
It's the same as journalism, to establish yourself. You know, you've got costs to pay, banners to pay. I wanted everyone to be able to get some money out of the show. I didn't have a producer. So we all got whatever sponsorship we did, and I paid everybody. And mm. so at the end, it was like, oh, okay, well, now there's nothing for next month, you know. <laughs> and, and I had to do journalism in between. But it was something I wanted to try to do, and I love it. And I and, and I, f I think that um, I think stand-up comedy is great. But it is to me, it's a, I'm tired of the genre. It's too predictable, mm. you know. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. You know, and you and really feel being there, done that. Being there, done that. Yeah. Also, you must remember, I have a I have a partner who's a clinical psychologist. You know, also says, oh, why do you want to do this? Because um, <laughs> there is something about developmentally, a child at a certain age saying, "Mama, cakey," and you come out with bloomers on your head, or you perform, and you mother, "Well, oh, lovely, darling, you're so funny." And there was something about eventually I started thinking this audience needs to pay to laugh I mean what sad people are these you know <laughs> um, you know your own ego and your own narcissism and need for 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 uh, I suppose applause or affirmation yeah. uh, I, I found that difficult I mean what mm. I wanted to do on stage was make a political statement mm. I wanted people to go oh my god she's right I don't don't want it to be well, that's about what Peter me. Dirk still does. I suppose so. Mm. Yeah, but mm. it's you know, look, it's one thing I could do if I if I if I if I get fired from the Daily Maverick, I will do a show. Um, <laughs> but I have done. I've decided to do some stuff around my book because there are lots of mm. stuff in the book that's not about me. Mm. You know, it's it's about cigarette ads. And when I grew up, all the adults around me, I mean, there was there were doctors saying more doctors smoke camel cigarettes than any other. Um, so my big question to myself is, when did the world go from being so stupid? I mean, where parents would smoke in cars with windows rolled. Mm up, you know, no seat belts. My next door neighbor who was white, tanned with brake fluid, Bunny van Royen, so I took a tan with brake fluid. Cancer? Never heard of it. You know, we ate MSG in all our food, we drank those Thousand Island, uh, you know, you remember we used to buy it in the shops, and then we used to eat our fruit salads from tins and fight about the last pale cherry. Yeah. You know, so that was the century I grew up in, and I was the whole time going with people, this is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Guys. You know, you're oppressing women and black people and we're eating cherries out of tins and you're smoking in the car. And it was like I was talking to aliens and then suddenly the 21st century happened. And yay, I was right. So, so, so there's a tremendous feeling of satisfaction and my chose question, how did we get there? How did we go yeah. from being so unconscious? And mm. I do link it to space travel um, because a month after I was born in April 1961, so I was born in March and April, uh, was the first trip into, the, into space by, by the Russians. No, mm. Yuri Gargarin, mm. who I think wore a beret and a little overall into space, you know, mm. some of this, and had a pencil while the Americans came out with their suits. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. They sent Yuri and who knows what motorbike into space. <laughs> so those things intrigue me. Yeah. You know, what yeah. affects the world and then being here on this little southern tip of Africa. Mm. Um, but then uh, you'd always written about things outside of yourself. Yeah. But now lately you've done this memoir. How oh, I mean, who convinced I, you to do that? Well, I, I, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but I have this darling friend. You know, there's some people in your life. I've got a strange construction of family because there were just four of us in South Africa. I didn't know my family. I didn't know my mother's family. I only discovered my German family much later, and they all thought we were living in a tent in the jungle fighting off lions. I, and I actually do think I wrote to my cousin once lying, saying there was an elephant outside or something. <laughs> um, uh, but Tom is a dear friend of mine in Europe. He's a very respected and well-known writer in Europe. I met him when he came to South Africa. He's very funny as well. He's, you know, Tom Lenoir. Tom Lenoir. Mm. Uh, and I've learned because there were just the four of us in this country and I didn't know anyone else that I've got what, um, I'm trying to remember his name, he was a young photographer killed, I think, in Somalia, called the Karas, uh, which is people who come into your life who are family. Mm. Uh, who are not family, but who are family. There's just something that they have there forever. There'll be one or two or three of them in your life. Mm. But no matter what, they'll be there. And Tom won a prize. He won a European writing prize. And he knows my story. I mean, and as a European, he was fascinated by my father's German origin, my mother, South Africa. You know, to me, it's just, you know. Who you are. And everyone mm. has a story. Mm. Everyone I mm. sit and talk to has an incredible story. Yes. But this one seems to be, has have many elements that if you were a director and I pitched it at you for a film, you'd say, no, this is too far-fetched. You know? But anyway, Tom arrived, took me to supper, and said, I want to buy some of your time. I want you to write your book. But before Tom did that, uh, something else happened, which was Marie Levita had interviewed me for, a De for De Burger for a book by the Daily Maverick, not about me. And him and I sat talking in the gardens for ages, and I spoke to him about my father dying and what that process was like and what my relationship was like with my father as he died and my engagement with that. And he wrote about that instead of the Daily Maverick. So I had this 
write up and then a publisher phoned me and said, I want that book. And then somebody came and said, completely apart from that, here's some money, write the book. I thought, yeah, I know I'm an atheist and this is just in case. Um, but the universe has put two things there. I would, it would be really silly not to do it. And mm -hmm. let's just see what happens. Let's see how it goes. And the privilege of having four months of stepping out of state capture, mm -hmm. stepping out of um, what I know to be a news cycle, which I'm plugged into yes. fully, 24-7, uh, was incredible. Yes, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. And so even if nobody buys the book or reads it apart from my children, uh, nothing can replicate that experience. Uh, mm -hmm. So I went, through the, I went through their little things that they kept, their little papers, their... The, the things we keep and when we die we wonder who will look at them. I found my father's, you know, their papers. Mm. Um, and I began to ask, well, who are they really? Because at a certain point you think you know your parents. We all do. We think you know your country. You think you know everything. So it was an opportunity to just... And I think everybody should do that once in a while. If you've mm. still got a computer laptop that you can fire up, look at those old pictures you took. Read the old letters someone wrote. Um, it's, it's about situating and you know i understand now very much uh, an african way of thinking around ancestral holding yeah. you know because it, it it is about the past and it's about the future and it's about honoring where you come from you can and and i've really to me writing this book was slaughtering to my ancestors was saying i i see you i see you thank you and let's, it was that let's process. talk about family you had a, an absolutely fraught relationship with your dad um, all his life. Yeah. Did that change when, when you adopted children? When um, you had children? Well, I, what changed was, um, it, uh, you know, the relationship was combative because I loved my father very much. But my father was a patriarch from a particular time. He was a good-looking man. He was a European man. He wasn't a rude man. He didn't drink. He wasn't awful to anybody. He was this, you know, this, this, this quite contained, beautiful German presence, but undermining of women yeah. and undermining of me uh, and not quite seeing me. And, and I know it wasn't personal because that's how the world is. I mean, I've experienced this in the workplace. Yeah. I've experienced it everywhere. It's not personal, um, but it's very hard as as a woman uh, mm. at the time not to see it as personal, as a child, as Marianne. Mm. Uh, and politically we were on different uh, planets. planets. And I also was ashamed of him being a German. When I began to watch the world at war as a child on TV and realized what the Germans had done, I thought, my God, I've got one of them in the house here. <laughs> you know, and there's a picture of him with this, you know, he was in the Luftwaffe. And I want to know why, who, what, when, did you question, why didn't you question, what happened? So that was my relationship with my father. And it continued until he nearly died, or he did die, <laughs> nearly died, he did die. But, um, and when I adopted my children, um, what was said, my father was a man who lived his life, I wanted to know who he was without the ideology, without the language, without the war, without what life does to you. Who is George Tam, Georg Tam? Who's the little boy without everything everybody told you you must be? And that mm. was what I continued to try External and do with sequel. Structures. Yeah, well, you know, and that makes mm. you afraid of other people. And so in the process of that, I think I came closer to the, to the person by being quite confrontational about Nazi ideology, about the Holocaust, about othering black people, about othering everything. So when I adopted my children, I said, I'm not asking your permission. Mm. I'm telling you. Mm. And if I detect, if I pick up anything, you will not harm these children. This is not their burden to two carry. Black, little black girls, two, two huh? black, my, my daughters, yeah. Mm. Um, but the interesting thing was, he fell in love with them because they just loved him. And, mm. and that was amazing to watch. My father was a man who waited for happiness. He thought happiness exists outside of you and that somebody gives it to you like a communion wafer. That he kept waiting for it. It just never happened. He lost his heimat, they lost the war, they followed Hitler. I mean, you know, he came to South Africa, he lost his wife who had a stroke. You know, I don't, my father was not a happy man. And I connected with him a lot and I understood, I read a wonderful play by Lorraine Hansberry called The Raisin in the Sun. And in that play there's a line that says, if you cannot love somebody at their worst, then don't bother to love them at all. <laughs> Um, we do need to love somebody when they're at their worst. Mm. Uh, all of us can be at our worst. And so I knew my father had no one else except me to mm. be his worst in. But I knew there was a better self there. So it wasn't easy. But I saw the better self emerge in kindness Tell and in consideration. Tell me about how you experienced him with these two little babies. Well, the one was then about three when you got the second one, eh? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Leila was two and, uh, and, and Kenya was three months old when she arrived. Um, yeah, and can you remember 
Or m maybe even a moment um, of him <laughs> holding... Oh, all the time. I mean, the first, yeah. when we first arrived with Leila in her little car seat, you know, this beautiful child in her car seat, and I knocked on his door in Somerset West where I went to visit him and opened the door and he went, yeah, but it's an infant, he said to me. So I said, well, she, she's a baby, yeah. Children what, arrive what, as infants. Yeah. I don't know what he, you know, I think my father was very much like people who have an idea that something's going to be one way in their head. So they'll say, I mean, I'll give a real trite banal example like let's go out for supper let's go there and I said do you really think you're going to arrive at the restaurant there's not going to be a queue that you can't phone before and so people have an idea oh I can't I'm going to do this you yeah. can't think you know you've got to you know engage with life it's not what you see in your head yeah. you know it's completely something else and and through that then and then he said to me but she's so beautiful um who who would give up this child you know so it it, it just opened up something um, and the, the, the physicalness, the whole. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, uh, he used to play, he used to sit with my youngest daughter on his knee and do a German song. I said, I hope that is not an old Nazi anthem that you are singing there. <laughs> what is that song? What is, the, I had you that clear, clear everything beforehand. But, you know, he would then phone me and say, are you coming at the weekend? Yeah. I mean, he, until, that, until then, he'd never done that. I always went to visit. He knew I'd come, I'd take him food. At Christmas, I'd bring the Christmas tree because he'd be grumpy, old, unhappy, talking, George, watching TV, world, Germany's going to, <laughs> You know, and telling me about South Africa, and I'd say, where did you, where did, you, where have you, where have you last been in the last two weeks? To the spa up the road and back, and you are now a political expert, are you? You know, so so we had those kind of conversations, and he could take it. You know, yeah. he could, he yeah. could handle it. Um, and then the girls changed that. Completely changed. I'd find him lying on the floor, playing with them with the blocks. I mean, it was. Uh, yeah. yeah. And how did they change you? Oh, how did the how did the decision come about? Well, you know, I've, I've been with my partner for 25 years, and when we first met, she said, listen, uh, I want children. And I said, no, it's out of the question. It's just unnatural. It's not, <laughs> who wants to do that? Why would you want to do that? And she said, don't, don't close the door. Let's think about it. So 10 years went by, and I thought, oh, yeah, it's not going to come up again. And then the conversation uh, came up again, and I thought, I'm too selfish. Um, I've got a job that is very demanding. Um, I don't know what kind of mother I will be. And I don't think any of us know until we are. There's no switch. Mm. And that's when I discovered my mother, when I became a mother. That was the interesting thing. She left so much treasure that you only find it when you look for it yourself. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the discussion happened uh, 10 years into the relationship. I can remember having these screaming matches in Newlands Forest, we'd walk, and I'd go, I don't want to, I can't, I'm going to be awful. I'm too childish, I'm too mature, I'm too narcissistic. Um, and then they arrived, you know, and it's like um, it was a ring of fire that you had to step through. And, it was a it it was a um, um, a way of becoming an adult for me, yeah. you know, and I th and because it felt you, you it's forever it's forever and and you all can't the, all put the, the baby shifts. in the cupboard no and and you do things then for them and not for yourself and there's yeah. there's something that, you know if you resist that um, you never learn what you need to learn and 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 somewhere inside ourselves as a species regardless of what we think is is that this is the flow of life death and life mm. and you're in the middle of it I mean you can have as much money as you like and be childless which is also great and be very happy and fulfilled I really believe that is possible it's true I don't say everybody should have children but for me. Me, there was something elemental in understanding because as my father was dying and retreating I had these two young this force of life coming at me and I was in the middle of it so I'd go and visit him as he was sick and dying and come home and I'd cry in the car because that's the only place you could cry because at home they get upset if they see mm. you crying and they were little because mommy's out of control you know and then they'd come home and say to me I'll depend on about a sandwich and you'd go uh, uh, <laughs> I've just come from Opa. Is he sick? Yes. When will he die? You know. <laughs> that, that. So they brought that beautiful lightness um, that young people have about death. They don't fear it. It doesn't mean anything to them. You know. And I must and care for them, not for him now. You know. So I learned all of those things through them. How did it change your relationship your, with your partner? Well, it got. It, you know, it was interesting to watch her become a mother and me become mm -hmm. a mother. So we've got different ways of doing things. She's, a, uh, you know, she's. she's more, yeah, I'm emotionally quite. Uh, 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 backward, I think. I'm not. I don't uh, necessarily want to engage emotionally with people's stuff. I think emotions are something you keep that and deal with it, and you know, <laughs> don't let it spill over all over the place first. You know, but with children, you have to. You know, yeah. so uh, I think we are complementary. Uh, uh, our investment was we wanted these children, um, and 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 they've come through us, and they with us, and we owe it to them to be good mothers and have. And, and so we work for the family together. We work mm -hmm. for them. We work for each other. I trust my partner immensely. She trusts me, although. I'm not to be trusted at times. I mean, I would do things like she'd work at the back and I'd say to the kids, 
They've grown out of it now. Come, let's put moustaches on everything. So <laughs> we would draw moustaches on ourselves and on the dogs and on every portrait in the house <laughs> and wait for her to come back in from work. <laughs> you know, if I say that now, they're like, oh, you know. So, so, you know, they allowed me to play again because I, I, I really do enjoy playing mm. and dancing. And I've realized now that comes from the Portuguese side of me. I didn't know that then. But I've always worried about what is this really, I mean, I, 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 you know, I feel like there's two 25-year-olds in me, you know, yeah. <laughs> when I yeah. did when I turned 50, yeah. because I constantly have the need to, um, uh, to play mm. or to laugh uh, at and something. And how, uh, South Africa is a difficult place to be in and to be in a mixed race family. What do you want, what do you dream for your daughters? Well, first of all, it's actually the easiest place in the world to be a mixed race family and a lesbian family, a gay, okay. gay family. I've, 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 I've not experienced anything except, uh, you know, innocent questions, I think, because people didn't know us. I think I've looked, you know, some people have looked at us here, but, you know, you know, what can I say? Um, I would like more my, so than in other countries. Yeah, I mean, in other countries, adoption by gay couples is not legal. So mm. if you have to, well, marriage, to is, through, not marriage is not legal. legal. So yeah. um, I'm very aware of the weight of the constitution behind me. People might not like me. They might not like what I'm about or what my children are about. But they have no right to do anything to me. And mm. I just really feel the weight of that. And it's mm. an extraordinarily liberating feeling. Mm. Um, we had we had um, a, a Zimbabwean woman who interviewed f to be a day mom, and when she discovered we were uh, two gay women with two children, she said, you are an abomination and I would never work for you if you were the last people alive on earth. And I sat opposite and I said, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm pleased you, you were able to say so, you know, thank you very much. But I could only say that to her because I knew that, and every South African we interviewed were, we said, yeah, well, of course we get what you are. We know yeah. what you are, We've, yeah. you know. And it's cool. It's cool, it's no problem. Yeah. Um, mm. so, so that was so enlightening to me. And, and, you know, Europe doesn't get this either. So if we travel with our children, they're probably going to arrest us and t put us and question us and ask us where they're from, are we trafficking? So you've got to deal with a whole lot of, you know, and then the, 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 initially the home affairs people didn't understand that you could put mother, mother, so on the one child I'm their father and, and then I'm their mother on the other certificate and arguing with bureaucracy about, sweeties, come now, 21st century, they've got two moms. And then the people say, oh, where's their parents? And you'd go, well, they're adopted. Yeah, but where's their biological parents? And I was saying, that's not a relevant. question. It's not relevant to you. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. they, they have their own stories. Here's so their it's, parents. It's, yeah, yeah, here's their mom. So, so you know, um, yeah. what I would wish for my daughters, really, is something I just saw. And I, I went to Europe for my book launch and loved it very much. It was lovely. It was problematic on some levels. But I watched young girls cycle at dusk through a city mm -hmm. on their bicycles with their phones. And without a care in the world. Yeah. And I would love my daughters to know what that feels like. To know, because, you know, I'm quite, uh, I'm not hyper, I don't want to transfer my hyper vigilance onto them. Mm. I've been doing some stories that have been potentially, you know, although I'm not the target, but you have, you've got to be careful. So I, I, when I come home with a car and I say to them, if I say to you in a particular voice, get out the car, do not fight with me. Do not ask for me that you must take your cell phone charger or your pudding that you left there. Just get out the car and go inside. Mm. So I, 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 I need them to become aware of where threats exist or where, where they mm. don't exist in South Africa. And I'm sad yeah. of that. Mm. And, and that surrounding them every day I, you know, are, are little girls and little boys who are being terribly, terribly hurt and murdered and killed. And they know it. They can hear it on the news. They know. Mm. And that's where we live. So my dream is to stay here. I have to stay here. I have to try and fix it. And I work with not only the Daily Maverick, but the people who have leaked information to the media, not just me. Those are the people I believe in and who mm. I have seen the, the integrity and I've seen the mm. willingness to, this country could be great if we weren't so bogged down in corruption and people trying to steal. We deserve better. We've been hurt for 300 years. No, stop it. Stop it. So I would love to be able to try and make some little difference so that they can can live here without that terrible fear that we all have. That we all and have. you want to be here to, oh, to yeah. make that happen. Absolutely. I don't yeah. want to be anywhere else. I can't be anywhere else. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take it as it comes. Oh. Marianne, thank you so much. Thank you, Ruda. Thank you. I like that note to end on that. Yeah. You know, Anton Rupert said when someone asked him, you're a billionaire in all every currency in the world. Your empire is centered on Europe. Why do you live in South Africa? He said, here my life makes a difference.
Uh, you mentioned the Ruperts. I can't believe it. White Monopoly Capital. <laughs> But he's right. <laughs> he's right. He's absolutely right. I mean, uh, but I think you need, if you're going to be here and you've benefited from being here, and you can't, that there's nothing you can do about that. You are white. Uh, be aware of that. Mm. And all Black South Africans ask you is understand, understand, mm. and, and contribute. I and think. contribute. Stay yeah. and make a difference, but don't be yeah. patronising. Don't, don't. You know, I, this country to me has the most interesting young intellectuals, lawyers, constitutional experts, mm. artists, writers, and they're all black, a lot mm. of them, yeah. most of them at the moment, mm. shaping a new hegemony. Our politicians are young, you know, I mean, whatever you think, I mean, you've got Klengwa, Nkululeko Klengwa in, in Parliament, and Julius Malema, and Buisen Nglozi, and mm. various others, and it's what's not to be excited about. Thank you. Thank you. And all of the very Thank best. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And may your daughters grow up to be wonderful women. I, I hope so. If I, <laughs> if I don't, they'll probably, if they don't, they'll write a book. So uh, do, that's that'll be I, okay too. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you for spending time with us. Until a next, a next time, goodbye.